All right, welcome back to the next episode of the Squadcast. I am Gus, back again on the host. I am one of the members of the integration team, and I'm super excited to be here today with Bacon Oreos for the first time on the cast. Bacon, how you doing this hey. morning? Oh, I'm doing all just fine, you know. Thanks for asking. Yeah, if some of you might know me as uh, one of the members of the uh, Fall Squad, being moderately active. Uh, yeah, you'll see me mostly in the Armor channel or a few other channels as well, but mostly there. And then we also have a second guest ever for the uh, squad cast. We have Badger here. How oh, Badger, Hi. how are you? Thank you. I'm doing good. I have been more active, at least in the simulation channels. Uh, I've been less active in Armor. I've been having theater problems, but I'm glad to be here. Outstanding. Well, we're glad to have you, man. Yeah, so am I. A couple things this past month. Uh, we had Fodder's birthday, which I wasn't able to attend the op, but I hear it was great fun. Were you guys both able to attend that? Uh, yeah, I was able to attend the, uh, I think it was this Venn co-op, as well as... I can't remember exactly what we played before that. I remember there was Zero Hour, which I missed out on, but I do remember Zven Co-op, which was really uh, an experience. It was the first time playing it. Really an old game. Put it into perspective just how much technology has evolved since then. can't remember which year was Zven Co-op released in. Does anyone know? This was the yeah. Half-Life 1 Co-op? Yeah, exactly. It's, uh, it's a Half-Life 1 mod with uh, custom maps and uh, parkour i don't remember when it released but i know it was i know it was around the same time that half-life one released and i've never played it but i've actually watched uh, a good amount of other people play it and it looks like a lot of fun being that half-life is what it is and while it is a great game it has a lot of like arma has a lot of physics and glitches and that make it <laughs> one heck of a of an interesting um environment i've actually seen People do the, um, I forget what it's called, but it's the Battle Arena one where you get to fight the Half-Life monsters against other monsters. And that looks like a lot of fun if you can get four people together and, and play. Yeah, speaking <laughs> of some very uh, odd quirks, I was especially uh, surprised to see that there was actual crouch jumping. Which basically <laughs> the idea was that you crouch and then immediately afterwards it propels you forward uh, as opposed to normal jumping, which was uh, a brand new experience for me. You don't do a lot of crouch jumping in real life? <laughs> no, I do not. Oh, okay. uh, maybe I should. It's bad yeah, for you the knees, I think. Try. Bad for the knees, um, but great for the quads and the glutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, I looked it up because I didn't know. I know it was a while ago, but 1999 is when Sven Co-op was released uh, for the first time on Steam. So it's been out there for a while. <laughs> oh, damn. It's only kind of popped in popularity recently, though. I've noticed a lot of people streaming it and playing it. You know, that would mean that Sven is probably older than some of our squad mates. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yeah, that's definitely. kind of insane that it's still still pretty popular. I mean, if it runs good, people are going to play it. If it's, you know, a glitchy, buggy nonsense that just crashes you to desktop constantly, no one's going to want to play it. But... I mean, people still play Arma. Yeah, I was going to say, are you talking about Sven or are we talking about Arma here? The other game that got played during uh, the birthday stream was uh, Ground Branch. That was the, oh, yeah. the one in the middle there. Oh, man. Ground Branch really is its really a special game in its own right. It's, it really does anything that uh, all the other shooters don't do. It takes tactical to the extreme, right, where you uh, get to change your uh, gun position proportional to your body. Yeah. Uh, you can't flag your teammates. It can also be a fun experience where you have uh, what we did, uh, it's team deathmatch, and uh, I think also just pure deathmatch. It was felt like Call of Duty almost. Just seeing that contrast in gameplay versus the way the game feels compared to others is just a uh, unique experience overall. I'd recommend it a lot. It's an, I can't speak too much on this uh, as it is yet another shooter game that I have yet to play. <laughs> I'm slowly working my way through uh, picked up squad on one of the the free weekends or whatever and played a bunch of that and I love it. Um, people say that if you love Arma, go ahead and try squad. Try and pick it up on a free weekend because people that love Arma will love squad. It does have, like Arma, kind of an insane learning curve. I don't really know about Grand Branch. I know that, um, what was the other game? Beyond the Wire, another one that I picked up recently. Again, another kind of crazy learning curve if you're if you're so used to arma's physics and shooting and controls 
you're gonna have to kind of empty your mind and and start fresh, like a like a newbie zero hour player. And I think ground branch ground branch is kind of the same way, right? With the kind of a crazy learning curve. I mean, ground branch actually is pretty intuitive in a sense. You know, the basics are there. You can pretty much transfer to from any other game. The way that it differentiates itself is the intricacies and the uh, details, the uh, nuances, shall we say, that make it more suitable for CQB and more in-depth. So you would have, uh, you know, proper cornering. You have a lot of attachment options. You can, uh, you can change the position of your attachment on your weapon, and a lot of people myself included found it quite enjoyable to make cursed looking guns by having uh, just the most insane looking attachment combos uh, with you know tri lasers uh, four flashlights and uh, <laughs> all that it's just it's a great experience even if you're not too uh, tactically oriented or to you know if you don't take it too seriously it's just great fun I uh, just wish there weren't so many limitations and the amount of stuff you can put on your pick anywhere else because I know you can't put certain sites in front of the other uh, there's, there's a few limitations that make it somewhat more grounded in reality despite my uh, enjoyment of said silliness but <laughs> yeah it's a great game in general i just have a few nitpicks about the way uh, there's a few bugs that happen there's uh you know the f keys which don't necessarily work for uh, certain features like crouching and proning and i mean it's just nitpicks everything else i'd say is pretty solid yeah, it's easy to learn, but hard to master, in a way. That's a lot of things, including Arma and Squad. <laughs> um, and then we have another another game that was played, I think, right? Did they play Zero Hour? Yeah, they played Zero Hour. That was the, the start of the, the birthday event. And uh, I guess it had a new update with 10-player co-op. Again, Mark It Down is another game that I'm going to add to my list to try and, at some point, pick up and play, probably on the Steam sale. But someone who's a little bit more knowledgeable on Zero Hour... Why don't you uh, tell us about how it was and what it is? Guys, have you played Zero Hour? Yeah, so I played when it first came out in um, early access. So when Fod had M7 on the Check Your Six podcast, I actually won a Zero Hour key that day. So I played the game, I probably put about 20 or 30 hours in. I mostly played solo co-op. I did some real co-op with... Uh, with some people and it was interesting um i'm not actually much of a tactical shooter player but it was it was really interesting to see the way everything worked in there because you could just repel up and down buildings and i really liked it but i haven't played in gods probably over a year at this point so i'm my knowledge of zero hour is extremely out of date yeah so i played zero hour i can't remember when i first played it i think it was well within its life cycle, I'd say. And I've only put about, you know, 10 hours in the game. And, you know, despite its failings and where it's sort of rough around the edges, shall we say, you have to put it in perspective and you realize that it's a single dev with uh, a lot of, uh, you know, people he commissioned for extra features like, you know, 3D models, sounds and all that. So when you put it in perspective, it's really a really nice game. So if you imagine, you know, the talent and uh, what can be put out by a single person with the limited amount of, you know, resources that he has, then you have to imagine you can extrapolate what if it, an entire team dedicated to that could work on. And in a sense, it's almost what Ready or Not is like, which I have not played, but I've heard really good things about and uh yeah zero hour which I would say is sort of like the uh indie mom and pop uh, homemade version of ready or not before ready or not was released kind of deal and I really like it. it has its own charm it's well as I said kind of rough around the edges sometimes but it's just it's forgivable I would say and it's really uh unique the uh ambiance is just great the lighting is nice it's got a rework in the lighting in a recent update as well and uh the AI just the uh sounds and the animation are pretty well done really makes it feel you know authentic in a way that's a great description yeah it's it's pretty accurate well i think we should move on to our next event that we had during the month of february and that was no rest for the weary no rest for the weary is an arma 3 operation by our uh, host today bacon oreos where we had five individuals who had their lives turned upside down after a mysterious figure pays them a visit. So it was a story-driven mission comprising seven total players. We had five player characters, one advisor, and one Zeus. So Bacon, like, give us the deets, man. Like, I watched the VOD on it, and I was just blown away by this mission. Like, I've never seen anything like this in Arma. 
So, thank you. Uh, so, No Rest for the Weary is, uh, I guess, a brainchild. In a way, it was me wanting to make a mission that really stood out. Uh, that did not really, uh, I guess, follow the uh, standards of what we usually have in the missions array. Uh, I wanted to expand on the, uh, you have a mission, you need to do that, go there, do that, extract. Yeah, I wanted to expand on that basic premise. And I also wanted to make the fee the uh, players feel like they uh, really were in a world that was lived in and uh, have it really be an immersive experience. And it was also very much shaped by a lot of um, the media that I consumed while I was making the um, operation. So for example, uh, in the beginning, I was playing a lot of Cyberpunk 2077, which is, man, it's top tier game. Uh, especially with all the recent updates and the world just really inspired me like you see the people chatting about you know you, it really feels like the npcs you know these dirty models wandering about in this virtual world actually have a life and you know it makes you want to dig around and sort of look into it more and i kind of really wanted to capture a bit of that essence in uh, my operation and there was i mean also all sorts of other features that i wanted to add it was all a culmination of what do I want to add to a mission that makes it pop? What makes it stand out a little bit more? And I just kept finding new ideas over the months. And I took like six or seven months uh, because I never really felt ready. Uh, it was sort of stuck in this uh, feature creep cycle. <laughs> And uh, I have to really call out Ray for being an instrumental and vital part of the development because he would help me figure out all the uh, coding and scripting with SQF, which you are a bit familiar with, I assume, Gus? Yeah, uh, SQF is a, a nightmare of a programming language, and uh, it it blows my mind what people have done with something so archaic and bizarre because learning almost any other programming language won't help you with sqf yeah it's um it almost makes me feel a bit bad that i you know it's probably the only and first programming language i actually learned in part because of the missions but yeah it really was so helpful there was so many crazy ideas that i came up with and i could just hit him up in the dms and be like hey i got this idea do you think it would be possible to do and there was so many things uh for example the cutscenes that was a big element that i wanted to implement where you know you'd have all your your cinema bars and that go up and down and then you uh, sort of freeze in the moment you get to watch the ai do its uh monologue and its little animation that is you know it was as a segment I felt was pretty important, which is why I had uh, three separate occasions where I wanted that to happen in the mission. You know, these cutscenes really helped with the uh, the lore and the uh, the story and the flow and the pacing and all that. And I also gave the opportunity to have these villains, these, uh, you know, special personalities. Like I had this one French guy, which I voiced, and I really wanted him to sound extremely French, like uh, overtly... Uh, Oh no, we're French, right? Kind of deal. <laughs> Very French. Very. Uh, we also had uh, one. Uh, the final boss is supposed to be sort of this Italian mafioso, kind of based on the uh, the Godfather movie, where it's like you know, very raspy voice. And uh, oh, well, I guess it was uh, inevitable in the end, right? The also the uh, second guy, which was a Scottish. I mean, he, I originally intended him to be this uh, British guy, but I just couldn't, for the love of me, imitate a British accent. So I just went straight for the, uh, hey, uh, I'm a Scottishman, yeah, <laughs> kind of deal. <laughs> I mean, technically, a Scottish accent is a British accent. Well, in, yeah, technically, legally, <laughs> don't, but... Don't let a Scotsman hear you say that. Yeah, oh, I don't want to piss off anyone with that, so... <laughs> we'll just say the Scots are uh, the unique... Uh, sort of breed, right? Uh, yeah, besides that, I'd like to touch on the uh, interesting tidbit that I noticed when I rewatched the VOD. Uh, someone actually in the uh, in the chat noticed the uh, similarity between the story that I had, you know, crafted, sorry, and um, she said it, it reminded him of a movie on Netflix, and I can say uh, exactly which movie it was, and it was a lot, uh, you know, it was a big part in the inspiration of the story, which was uh, the movie Triple Frontier from 2019, and the premise is very similar, you know, it's like uh, you have these five operatives, the ex-military, they're kind of down on their luck, and they decide to go and raid a uh, cartel, uh, in my case, you know, it was sort of criminal organization, very generic. You know, inspiration really fit in with 
what I wanted the experience to be, which was more tight-knit and uh, limited to a, sl a small number of players. Because, well, for one, it helps with not having to rely on player attendance to make your event happen, right. which I'm very glad I did. And it also makes it more, more easier to uh, make the story work because uh, one of the elements that I really wanted to capture as well, which is the, uh, you know, the comedic trope of the uh, army recruiter that shows up at your doorstep and says, hey, want to join the army? <laughs> And uh, that's why I had Ray show up with uh, his role, which was the uh, FBI, no, CIA agent. You know, I wanted him to be this actor, right? He's in on the game and he's, uh, I jokingly called it an N NPC or non non player character because he acts like an NPC, but he's really just an actor and he knows everything that's going to happen of the plot. And he's, he's the one that gets the players together. He's the one that uh, makes everything happen until a certain point and then uh, plot twist he ends up betraying the characters and that's his cue to you know do a little monologue and then exit the scene and that's when the players actually have to figure it out for themselves you know oh wait now we don't have our guidance anymore you know tactical operations center is gone what do we do we have to make our own decisions and uh, that's when they had to figure out where to find the final boss and uh you know, and the mission. And so this general flow of the mission was, at least I feel, and I hope it was properly conveyed, uh, you know, very dynamic. I watched uh, some of the stream and then I finished up in the VOD. And I have to say that there, there's a lot of YouTubers out there that do, or streamers, YouTubers and streamers that do Arma 3 content. And it's great. But I don't think I've ever seen storytelling. I mean, every YouTuber tries to kind of, kind of create a narrative or a story to piece their you know, their, their stories together, whether, or their, their videos together, whether it be Karma Cut or Rubik's Raptor, he makes great kind of, um, comedic edits and stuff like that. And, and some of them do have a story, but none of them have a, none of them are true, well, narratives, a narrative, uh, you know, it's, it's usually all done in editing. It's not usually done in the op itself. And I was really impressed by the, the storytelling, like, uh, most, most ops, you know, want to either go the tactical route or the, wow, this is really cool route with great visuals and amazing explosions and cast fire and, you know, cool stuff like that. But I was really impressed by the kind of down to earth storytelling that is, I guess, a kind of a cool drink of water compared to all the other Arma content out there because it can, it's all very tactical, but then you have this kind of nice change of pace. So good job, Bacon. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, I, that's exactly what I was trying to, you know, capture. And it's what I wanted to make the mission really about. All about making the, uh, well, the player and also the viewer by extension invested in the uh, mission because it's easy to go, okay, we're a bunch of guys. We have a mission to do. Let's do it. And then we'll be done. But once you start adding a layer of lore onto it, that's when it becomes, I guess, more interesting, I guess. Uh, for certain people, uh, in me included. And it's also more, I guess, uh, you, you get more connection to the story because now you actually have a purpose. You know, oh, wow, this is uh, this is why we're doing this. So for example, for the guys in this mission, the whole premise was that, you know, this gang is uh, responsible for being the, you know, the primary exporter of drugs and cocaine in the uh, continental U.S. So the CIA has to send out these uh, special covert operatives because they kind of want to make it a uh, bit of a hush-hush uh, elimination kind of mission. You know, it's sovereign territory. They don't really want to be seen as American troops on the uh, continent or on the island. So, you know, if with all these uh, nuances, now it becomes more believable in a way as well. Yeah, I think for me, the thing that really sets that apart, because like, I don't really play a lot of Arma. And so oftentimes when I'm watching Arma VODs, I'm like, okay, yeah, it's this big, huge battle. And there's a bunch of tactical stuff happening. And it's going to be the same stuff for like three hours and then it's over. Uh, and if you're not super into Arma as a player, like watching a video like that gets kind of dry after a while. And that could have been what this was. You know, it's sure there's a chain of mission objectives to go achieve, but like you could have chained missions without telling a great story. But having, you know, all of that voice acting and prep work and and I think the thing that really pushes it over the top was like Ray as this, you know, character in the story. So he's kind of doing traditional Zeus things, you know, overlord and making sure things work and stuff. But he's he's a part of the story. And that 
makes it interesting to watch in a way that most Arma stuff just isn't to me. And, like, you could tell from the reactions that you're hearing, like, in the chat on the VOD, like, everybody's having such a good time. For me, my favorite moment is at the end, right after they, they cap the final baddie, and then the FOD Squad's theme starts to swell in. I'm like, oh my god, this is perfect. <laughs> Yeah, I knew I wanted to have this uh, big, epic, badass moment, but, you know, in, uh, like in the uh, classic movies where the, bad, or the good guy always looks away from the explosion, you know, in the background and sunglasses and epic music and all that. And I was wondering what kind of music would fit, but and then I realized, wait, well, this is a Fart Squad op. We already <laughs> have the Fart Squad theme. It only fits, and it's just going to make the uh, the players more enthused and more, you know, ecstatic because Wow, the Fart Squad theme plays. This is the badass moment. And uh, yeah, I'm just really glad it played out the way it did because that's exactly what I envisioned in my mind. But yeah, um, the way I would really describe this operation is a giant amalgamation of lots of features that I wanted to try in a mission. And in a way, it was a giant experiment because a lot of this stuff was not really done before or just I had not done anything quite like it before so this giant experiment and um you know it was really fun and functional surprisingly yeah so i i have one more question before we learn turn to our last aar topic but here's my question are we gonna get a follow-up i do have a few ideas on how to do the follow-up indeed out Standing. So Operation Harsh Doorstop has launched in the month of February, and we have a server up for it. Well, technically, we have three servers up for it. For those that don't know, Operation Harsh Doorstop is free to play game from Drakeling Labs, and it has a, a huge focus on being a robust modding environment. So they have this software development kit that you can just download for free, and it's essentially a custom Unreal Engine editor. So when you open it up, it just looks like you've opened Unreal Engine, but it's got all of their code and a bunch of assets baked right into it to really ease the process of building up a first person shooter. So it's absolutely like fantastic place to get started. And it's kind of a midpoint between like, ah, uh, well, I'm just doing modding and like it's kind of real game development. You know, you can go in and write in Blueprint or you can write your code in C++ and you build it up basically just like you're really building a game. So super fascinating. Um, we have a traditional co-op server. We have a Starship Troopers modded server and we have a Halo mod server. So really excited about that. Um, have either of you two played any harsh doorstop it's funny you mentioned that uh while we're recording i went ahead and added it to my library because i didn't realize it was free to play i thought i had to pay for it um <laughs> and i thought it was harsh doorstep that's the first time i've heard someone say doorstop and that's how it that's actually the name of it i don't know for <laughs> for for some reason in my brain i thought it was harsh doorstep <laughs> no i haven't played it i'm sure bacon has but i was just going to say quickly you talked about robust modding um the game came out february 15th and we already have, well, there's obviously already a Starship Troopers and a Halo mod. I mean, that's pretty quick. I know mods for Armor for Forger came out pretty quick as well, but, I mean, it's February 28th. That's not even 15 days yet since it's been out, and it's already got, a, from what I understand, a pretty good Starship Troopers mod and a pretty good Halo mod, which is insane. Yeah, so I've played a bit of Operation Dosed Up, uh, you know, a little bit recently, a bit more back when it was still like a close alpha the improvement i am so happy to see the improvement that happened over time yeah it's a great vision i really like the uh, the way blue drake puts it where it's you know wanting to get the original project reality but this time it's you know this framework that everybody can access for free and make their own content for and uh yeah we've never seen anything like it before and i really do like this you know, this new venture, so I really hope it works out. Uh, the game right now is a bit rough around the edges, but it's a bit of, it's an early access title, it's a beta. There's a few nitpicks that I have, which I'm not going to cover because obviously by the time this podcast comes out, a lot of features will have been fixed. Everything is just constantly being developed. And uh, from what I can tell at the moment, it's got a lot of potential. You know, the more the community grows, it has the potential to become very much like Arma, where you get the uh, advantage of having lots of people and, you know, community generate content, which then helps grow the community of the game. And it's this self-perpetuating cycle. And, you know, 
the fact that it's a new title in 2023 now means that it still has a long way to go and i can't wait to see what it looks like down the, uh, later down the road i personally think that if harsh doorstop ever gets to the point where they have something like a zeus mode it's going to be uh, a serious contender for people's time and attention compared to arma because like if you add a zeus mode you could start to immediately do things like uh, no rest for the weary and it almost becomes easier to do things like that because unlike arma where you've got to do everything through this mission editor which is weird or sqf which is ultra weird because you get access to like the base code that's gonna run in unreal engine anything you could do in an unreal engine game you could do in operation harsh doorstop and so if they have a zeus mode come in at some point or zeus like mode operation harsh doorstop becomes a, a different take on how arma could work now because the engine is different, it's not going to be as big as Arma, because like if you look at PUBG, which is also in the Unreal Engine, it doesn't handle the bigness and all the vehicles as well as Arma does. But I think on the whole, that probably ends up not mattering quite as much. I think Harsh Doorstop has an extremely bright future ahead of it. From Yeah. Yeah, and, and um, I was going to say something. I've watched a couple of videos on it since... It kind of became a big thing on FOD Squad. A lot of talk about it and whatnot. I just had to go and check it out. And what I will say is Arma 3 prides itself on its realism and high detail. Like, if you go look at the guns from even the base game in Arma 3, you can read the text on the guns. The fact that it says MX and the, the caliber is 6.5 millimeters and the manufacturer and the warnings. Crazy detail. Uh, same thing with vehicles or uniforms vests whatever really prides itself on its high realism meanwhile you have a game like squad which prides itself on its high playability tons of servers tons of game modes tons of faction tons of weapons to use to really just get in there jump into a game make some friends and have a blast and i feel like hard store stop is like the 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 high kind of realism of arma and the high playability of squad Kind of just smushed together and free. And then the ability to also add things like, I'm sure there's going to be a Star Wars mod out. I There already I can, is. <laughs> yeah. I'm not surprised. Uh, Starship Troopers, Star Wars, Halo. I mean, the the most popular, I'm, there's probably Warhammer 40k coming eventually at some point, or if, if, if it's not already out. All the popular kind of gamer communities, I'm sure will all have their own mod, whether it be World War II or Desert Storm or whatever. I feel like it'll be a, a great combination for those that want the high playability but also want the high realism but don't want to own two separate games and and arma 3 and squad are not cheap and so the fact that doorstop is free and has pretty good realism and and playability that's pretty awesome yeah one of the things that i want to point out is that arma is you know very much scale oriented so i don't know how it is now with reforger because reforger seems to have gone back to the scale you know of a single island can't remember the uh, kilometer square but it's i'd say about the size of Malden now but arma 3 really is probably one of the larger games out there in terms of map size in a way that makes it unique the only problem is you're kind of battling with the uh, old engine, which is quite uh, ancient now, and the uh, limitations in the amount of AI that you can have, which honestly is a shame because it, you could take so much advantage of the scale of the maps if you... You know, if you could have more stability the, with the more assets you put on the map. Doorstop seems to be like it's aiming more towards a smaller scale, let's say Squad, for example. I'd, I'd say is the best comparison point, which is, uh, you know, it's not ludicrously huge where you can have jets flying around comfortably, but it is still quite sizable and also accessible for infantry. So with that sort of mid-scale you know, it's not quite the same uh, size as Call of Duty maps where it's uh, 10v10 uh, in a cramped uh, mall building, right? So the scale of House Doorstop really lends itself to what it could be, which is accessible for its own niche and not really overreach on Arma's expansive, massive focus. Yep, that makes sense. But I think it's time for us to move on to our main discussion topic for today. And part of the reason that we have this cast of uh, individuals here for the, 
the discussion is because today we're going to be talking about strategy and simulation games. And that is something that uh, the three of us have all been fairly active in those channels. So uh, I'm just going to open it up by giving a little background of my preferences and stuff in the, the strategy space. Uh, I come from a heavy um, civilization background. I started playing civilization 2 in like 96 so i've been i've been playing civ basically my entire life and so everything that i think about strategy games comes from that basis if you hear me say something that sounds a little weird it's probably because i'm thinking about civilization but what about you bacon like what's what are your big things in the strategy and sim genres well actually i started much like you did uh with civilization i think it was my first game ever civilization 3 which is i mean it's just legendary lots of people know it lots of people love it feels weird to look back on it now but then i moved on to civ 4 uh age of empires 2 which is also a great classic and then i uh, moved into a few of the paradox titles like for example um hearts of iron that's a definitely more difficult i tried it recently it's it takes a steep learning learning curve yeah what else have i played in the strategy games the uh, Men of War series, or Men of War-like, is uh, this new thing that I've discovered within the last year or so, and it's just the RTS genre really is its own unique thing. It keeps you engaged. You know, lots of people might see strategy, which is like I used to for a number of years. I used to see strategy as this kind of boring, sort of sit in your chair and click on the screen kind of deal. I never really assumed that strategy could be engaging in any way i mean even civilization is relatively relaxed kind of game but rts is man they just take it up a notch and with men of war assault squad 2 you are constantly managing your troops you're constantly giving them orders you're constantly pesting about their lack of competence and it's just a really enjoyable experience it keeps you hooked yeah i love it it's kind of like armor but now this time you're in the overhead and you're controlling all the troops and uh you know it's all over the course of a battle but yeah badger do you have any experience with strategy games i do although not uh, not in the civ realm my first real strategy game was command and conquer so mm -hmm. kind of that rts instead of the civ stuff and uh I, uh, Command and & Conquer and Re uh, all the Red Alert games are just amazing. They're still fun to play even today, and you don't need a good PC to play them. You know, they're kind of that 32-bit kind of RTS game, which is a lot of fun to just get on and, you know, kind of BS with your, your buddies and, and play a game. There are still servers hosting Command & Conquer games to this day, which wow. I don't remember when that came out, when the, when Red Alert, I think that was my first game that I played, but there's a, a grape program that's not, unfortunately not through Steam, so if you use Steam kind of for everything and are weary of outside, outside launchers and programs, I understand, but there's a open source collection of Command & Conquer games called OpenRA, and it's like mm. a 70 kilobyte file that you install, and it has eight Command & Conquer games in it, and they're all open source, so you can mod them, you can change them, and I was introduced to it by a good friend of mine that uh, I used to play Command & Conquer with a couple years ago. I didn't know him until a couple years ago, but uh, he introduced me to kind of like this whole... Because I wanted to get back into that RTS kind of world, because I kind of strayed away and gone to the more sim like Arma and Squad and stuff like that. And uh, I was looking at buying the games, but I couldn't find any keys or, or, and Steam didn't have them for sale. And I was like, well, and then he showed me Open Array. It's a little glitchy. It's an open source free creation, I think is what it is. And it, it comes as an installer. You install, you install the, the program and boom, you have uh, the original Command & Conquer. You have Red Alert. I think you have Command & Conquer, Dune 2000, uh, among other ones. And then beyond that, uh, I've played a, a lot of strategy games. One of my favorites is, it's an RTS again, uh, Star Wars Empire at War, um, which is a classic. A classic, yes. I originally had it on disc, or on CD, and I bought it, I think it was a birthday gift from my parents to me, because I was raving about how good it was, and they're like, let's get it for him. And I actually still have that. I found it the, found it the other day. I don't have a disk drive in my computer. I now have it on Steam because it's available on Steam. It has an amazing mod community that more than just Star Wars mods. It's funny that people are taking a Star Wars game and there's a Warhammer 40k mod for it. There's 
a Halo mod. There's even a Starship Troopers mod for it. Nice. And taking the whole premise of Star Wars and just going, nope, don't want that. I want Starship Troopers, or I want Halo, or I want, you know, Warhammer 40k. But the Star Wars mods for it, whether it be the Yoden mods, stuff like that, are incredible. And, and, and an incredible amount of work put into them. You know, it's still kind of that low-res RTS from the early 2000s, so you don't have the real, you know, high-quality textures and stuff like that with a game like Doorstop or Arma or Squad. But, I mean, they look great. Someone has put a lot of work into making a free addition to a game from, like, 2005. <laughs> well, I don't know if they count, but City Skylines is a, a favorite of mine. And, oh, yeah, um, that definitely counts. Surviving Mars is another uh, Paradox Interactive game that is kind of the same thing as City Skylines, but more um, Marsy. <laughs> I hey. guess. I can't think. Oh, Factorio is a favorite of mine <clears throat> strategy, or as it's known in the community, Cracktorio, <laughs> uh, because of the amount of time that you will inevitably consume. You'll open the game, start a new world, and suddenly it's 3 a.m. and you don't know how you got there. And one of the other things, you know, we kind of wanted to do strategy and sim at the same time. And, you know, my big draw in the simulation channel is Kerbal Space Program. But I know you've been in there uh, and you were even talking about it this morning before we started recording. Tell us a bit about uh, SnowRunner. SnowRunner is the third game in the Spin Tires series of games. The first game was Spin Tires. The second was Mud Runner, And now we have SnowRunner, which is the culmination of the three games it is a an off-road truck sim game and i know people are like oh great it's a truck driving game like ats no it's it's much slower and i guess i just used a um an abbreviation there ats stands for american truck simulator that's if you want the on highway fast trucking experience this is this is the you will get stuck game snow run um <laughs> It is, it prides itself on incredible mud physics, incredible off-road physics. There are glitches. I mean, there's going to be with any game and weird physics, you know, where the trucks and physics freak out. But it is probably one of the most kind of chill games to play that involves driving. I know people aren't, not a lot of people are into driving games. Some people are. And it's very easy to watch YouTube with or listen to music and just drive and because everything in the game takes a lot longer than you think it does not really at any point will you be going fast ever right because fast means either you're gonna get stuck which if there's no trees or other things to winch to around you means you have to go find another truck to pull it out with <laughs> you can't just like magically warp it out of the mud and go it's free no you have to pull it out going fast means you take damage. There's a damage model uh, with individual pieces and parts. So tires, engines, suspensions, suspension components, fuel tank. I think that's it. And you can also damage your load, whatever. If you have a truck that's carrying a load, whatever it might be, whether it be a logging frame or like a flatbed, that can be damaged as well and reduce your load carrying capacity. Uh, damaging suspension means that your truck either doesn't absorb bumps as easily or has kind of floppy suspension that kind of just flops around loosely. Damaging your tires completely means that you actually have flat tires that make it really easy to get stuck in the mud. Damaging your engine means you have less power, you burn more fuel, and so you have to be really mindful of all that. Uh, going fast also equals lots of fuel consumption. Fuel is a thing you got to constantly watch because there's uh, SnowRunner kind of switched it up in the way that how the maps work. Uh, the previous maps for Spin Tire and Mud Runner were like, you have a region like Russia or Alaska or the U.S., and then you have a map that's pretty expansive and fairly big, and you're just in that that region, that map. Well, Snow Runner switches it up and adds a lot more to the game, being that start out in Wisconsin, U.S. Okay. Um, in Wisconsin, you have four individual maps that you have to discover. And they each have jobs, they each have special challenges. You know, the, the first map you start with might have a garage, a fuel station, and stuff like that. But the other maps probably don't have a garage where you can change and repair your vehicles, a fuel station to fill up your vehicles. So you got to be really careful. Like, the map I'm on right now, 
doesn't have a fuel station, doesn't have a way to repair vehicles, so I have to go to the other map and then drive over to the map I'm currently on. If I want to bring fuel over, if I want to bring repair parts over, because I have no way to get it there other than to truck it over. So you got to be very mindful of how you how you go about it. Uh, there's the mud is very thick on most maps. Snowrunner adds snow and ice, which as if the mud wasn't bad enough. Now you have <laughs> slick nonsense. Uh, they added chained tires, <laughs> tire chains on tires for grip okay. on snow and ice. And I haven't gotten into any really snowy maps. I've done a little bit in Alaska, but it's a challenge. Uh, I think I'm only 11, no, I'm 15% into the game. And I've already completed Wisconsin and Michigan, which are the two U.S. maps. And I'm only 15% completion. If you is... think Alaska is bad, just wait till you get to the Russian snow maps. Yeah, I actually <laughs> played one of the Russian maps already called... Uh, I'm going to butcher it, but Tamir, Russia, Tim which is... Yeah, Tamir, Tamir, I think, is something like that, yeah. Which is, it's it's it says the name first, and then the map name is the Drowned, the Drowned Lands. And boy, I had to go download some sp specific mods, because there is a modding community. I had to go download some mods with some trucks with much bigger tires, because I drove out of the garage went off-road for the first time, and got immediately stuck. So deep that I couldn't winch it out, and I had to actually <laughs> get another truck out of the garage and pull it out, and I ended up having to push it out because I couldn't pull it out. <clears throat> nice. It's it's a crazy game. The mud is crazy. The snow is crazy. I hear there's a couple sections where you drive on pure ice, and you have to, you have to be very careful on how you drive because uh, if you go a little bit too far to, the, to one side of the road, you'll just tip over, which... When your truck tips over, your engine shuts off, and you lose the ability to use your winch. So you have to Ooh. roll the vehicle back over first before you can attempt to winch. If you have a loose load like pipes or logs, and you roll over, all of that spills out. Oh no! And all over the place. And so you have to actually use a, a logging crane to pick the logs up and put them back in your truck one by one by one by one. The cranes are very annoying in the game, but they're functional. <laughs> They right. have a lot of freaky <laughs> physics, but let me tell you, there. I have never, I don't think I've ever alt f forward in a game more than I have in SnowRunner. Yeah, Driving Snow from Runner. one edge of the map to the other edge of the map can take you 45 <laughs> minutes in game. It's crazy because of yes. how sticky the mud can be and crossing rivers and dealing with almost rolling over. And <laughs> you get within spotting distance of your objective and you roll over and dump your load and it's like nope alt f4 yep snow runner is definitely one of those games where you have to take it with a chill mind and uh you have to take it with patience and sometimes too much is too much so yeah if you go in thinking you're just gonna race car every map it might be i mean the michigan map has a lot of paved roads on it or not michigan wisconsin has a lot of paved roads yeah you can race around a little bit but if you take that mindset and go over into uh, the, like the Central Asian map that I'm on right now, which has a lot of strange dips and mud holes that are surprisingly deep, you're going to be done for. You're going to be stuck in a hole with your load dumped all over the road. <laughs> Consider that a warning to those of you who wish to try SnowRunner. It can be incredibly rewarding, but also a little bit frustrating if you don't know how to take it the uh, right way. Now, I'd like to just backtrack a little bit and uh, give... Gus, a little opportunity here to talk about strategy for a minute. Gus, you've been doing a lot of Crusader Kings, uh, CK3 more specifically. Would you like to tell us more about that and uh, your enjoyment of the game, what you think about it? Oh, man. So CK3 actually kind of caught me by surprise when I picked it up, I don't know, probably about six months ago. I had played a little bit of Europa Universalis, I think, two when I was a, a teenager, I couldn't get into it. It was way too complex for where my head was at the time. I just couldn't make any sense out of the systems. And because it's from the same developer, like I just sort of always ignored Paradox games. And I have no idea what convinced me to download Crusader Kings 3. But as soon as I picked it up, like... I could tell that CK3 was different because their main innovation is that unlike almost every other strategy game where what you control is sort of like a, a realm or an empire, in Crusader Kings, what you actually control is an individual dynasty 
where when your character dies, you control that person's heir. You know, when you go through that succession event, your realm can expand or it can contract. So you're not tied to any specific region where, you know, you start as the king of England. Well, if England falls, your game is over. No, that's not really how it works because you're still who you are. And as long as you have land, like you get to keep playing. And it takes all of these great grand strategy concepts and personalizes them in a way that most other strategy games don't really do. And so I've I was just super drawn to that. And now I use it as essentially a storytelling framework where I'm going to play the game uh, essentially however I want to, but then I can go back afterwards and use it to like build up a story and essentially tell an alternate history for it. And I'm just like, I'm in love. Yeah, it is something about the way, uh, especially when you build up a huge empire, right? Uh, at some point, you can s split it up, you know, between your different heirs if you have multiple or, you know, extended family. So uh, would you say in a way that it makes uh, expansion harder and harder the bigger you get? Both yes and no. It sort of depends on how you want to approach ruling your realm. I'm currently wrapping up a playthrough where I was very particular about the way that I expanded. Uh, I named all of my kids uh, after members of the FOD squad, and I wanted to make sure every time I named someone after the squad, for someone in the squad, that they would get their own at least duchy level title, and that their descendants would be able to maintain that title. And after like 10 or so generations that meant that i had like 15 families worth of people that i felt obligated to give a duchy to and in the end like i had to keep expanding to keep making that work and like that's not the correct way to play a wide empire in crusader kings 3 because you really need to have a really strong consolidated power base in order to pull that off and I just never had a strong consolidated power base. So I was constantly fighting rebellions like we were Vikings. And so the Catholics were pissed off because we basically took over all of Catholic Europe before the end. There was so much infighting because there's all these people that have competing claims on each other's lands or competing claims for the empire. So there's all sorts of internal conflict. But it was hilariously fun to play that way. Yeah, it's definitely a non-standard way of playing. Um, I like that you took the initiative of doing it your own style, um, which in a way makes it unique, albeit challenging, but in a, diff uh, in a different way. I really like it, and I really enjoy the uh, storytelling as the uh, story enjoyer. really do like the way you put it into a more, you know, chronologically correct story where, you know, you get to follow the uh, expansion and the evol evolution of the uh, country that you're ruling. And seeing the uh, names of Fox Squad members pop up here and there, it just makes it all the more engaging. Uh, for us in the Fart Squad community, because it's like, hey, you know, you can joke and say that, uh, hey, uh, this guy's, I know him and he's doing this. Oh, wow, this is so not like you to uh, commit uh, murder with the uh, poisoned wine blast. You know, it's like all these uh, parallels you can make sort of make it more fun in a way. And I mm -hmm. really do like the videos that you make. Thank you. So I'm actually uh, kind of in the middle of editing the final episode of the, the FOD Squad Dynasty. Uh, the gameplay is all wrapped up for it, but I've had a bunch of things uh, get in the way of me finishing that editing. Like, it's all recorded and stuff. I'm ready. I just haven't had a chance to work on it for, like, two weeks. So, you know. <laughs> but I've got plans for for what the next series will be. I've uh, I've sort of been messing around in a, a new save just to make sure that my idea is actually viable. And I think it's going to be interesting. It's a new a new sort of gameplay challenge for me. So I think it'll be fun. Oh yeah, I look forward to it. Have you guys ever heard of something called a busman's, a busman's holiday? A busman's holiday? No, but I'm about to look it up. <laughs> I can tell you what it is. So okay. a busman's holiday is when you do something in real life and then go home and play a game about it. You're on a busman's holiday. Um, okay. It's kind of more of a, a gamer definition than, um, or if you, you know, you, you pretend to do something 
um, and then do that same thing in real life, like like RP or whatever. And I, I wanted to bring this up quickly because we're talking about strategy and simulation. Um, sure. One of the games that I enjoy playing in the simulation category that I brought up earlier, just quickly, was American Truck Simulator, which for me is a busman's holiday, being that I'm a truck driver and that I go home and play American Truck Simulator. <laughs> right. Um, and American Truck Sim has, they, it's a great game. There's two games from SCS Software. There's uh, ETS 2 and American Truck Simulator. ETS is European Truck Simulator. I have not played for that played that game, so I cannot speak for it, but it's a great game. American Truck Simulator is near and dear to my heart because that's where I figured out what I wanted to do with for my career, which was pretty cool that they simulated the the truck driving experience so well and and they really pride themselves on their realism, which can be kind of goofy sometimes being that collisions with world objects or <laughs> uh, they they have simulated how real world drivers drive to a T, how people actually drive in the U.S. and okay. it's it's scary. <laughs> <laughs> it is scary sometimes. With the if you're playing in single player, you have AI vehicles that they have captured real world drivers so well. Right. <laughs> they have recently added Texas to their DLC dates. They're slowly working their way east. Before that was Montana. Both of which are incredibly beautiful. They pride themselves on looking as close to the real world as possible. Uh, they just got done with their Valentine's Day sale and their Valentine's Day skin pack. They do a skin pack usually every Valentine's Day. As well as they just released the Western Star 5700 XE. Which all of their vehicles are based on real world vehicles. With official licenses from the trucking companies or from the truck manufacturers. And trailer manufacturers, so that's pretty cool. Nice. You don't need a steering wheel to play this game. I know a lot of people, if you look up American Truck Sim, you'll see people playing with steering wheels and pedals. You can play mouse keyboard. Or you can play with a, an Xbox controller or a PS4 controller. You don't need a fancy setup. But if you'd like to take that extra step and feel the realism, getting a force feedback wheel or even one without it works great. I have a 12-speed truck shifter and a pedals board with a, uh, a clutch, a brake, and a gas. and a nice steering wheel and stuff like that because I like to feel the realism. Uh, but it's definitely something that one of those games that you kind of have to like get prepared for, like because it takes a little bit of setup time to set up the. Because I don't keep the wheel set up all the time. I don't have a permanent setup. It's one of those games that I enjoy just popping on a YouTube video and driving or listen to some Spotify and driving because it's relaxing. And driving games aren't for everybody. Some people like racing instead of, you know, leisurely driving a truck. If the single player experience isn't for you, ATS recently, uh, I think in January, or maybe it was earlier, released Convoys, which is their multiplayer mode, which is where someone can self-host through servers that are with built into into the ATS game. So when you when you create a new lobby, it creates a server, like a dedicated server. People can join. Uh, you can run mods in it. So, uh, and anybody that joins the server will automatically download the mods. So you can play with modded trucks, modded trailers, skin packs, stuff like that. Uh, there's also another multiplayer mode, which is actually a mod, which was the original multiplayer mode called Truckers MP, which is available for ETS and ATS. And it has arcade and simulation servers servers available for it. Truckers MP is, there's a lot of things that are missing, obviously, because you have limitations because it's a mod and it's limitations of the engine. Um, there's no traffic, no AI traffic in Truckers MP. But if you join a populated simulation server, you won't notice a difference because usually there's trucks everywhere. So. Right. Another, another one of my favorite simulation games. Uh, uh, unfortunately, it seems like besides Arma 3 and Squad, which I would consider kind of in that sim role as well, maybe Arma 3, Less than squad. It seems like all of my driving game or all of my sim games are driving games, like Beam and G Drive and stuff like that. So yeah, that makes sense. I farm sim, yeah. driving <laughs> right. Yeah, tractor. Drive a tractor. Drive a, a semi tractor. It it makes sense. I uh, yeah. I don't really get into the the slow drivey stuff. Like I've tried a little bit of it and I just get bored. But like I have ADHD and so you know these things happen. But I, I love a good racing game. I would like to get into some flight sim stuff, but I haven't been able to justify the cost of a flight stick. 
but you know like you mentioned with snow runner you don't really need a, a wheel to be able to play it i think that's one of the things that i really like about uh kerbal space program is you don't really need a, a flight stick to get into that because once you start learning good rocket design flying a rocket in kerbal space simulator or kerbal space program should be really easy because it it'll essentially fly itself once you get it on the right trajectory i definitely can appreciate when something is in the sim genre but doesn't require ultra specialized equipment in order to enjoy it you said you like yeah. racing you should check out uh wreck as far as racing games go it, it is a racing game but it's banger racing it's old cars with dented up sheet metal and the best part about it is being rude on the racetrack is encouraged. So <laughs> coming up to somebody and rear-ending their car really hard so they spin out and crash into the wall, you get points for it. And nice. or, or doing a pit maneuver on the back of someone's car and spinning them out. Or sideswiping somebody really hard into the wall. You get points for it, and it's encouraged. They're all banger cars, so, you know, dented sheet metal and, you know, worn-out engines and stuff like that. But it's a great game. It's got progression. You can do racing, you can do goofy stuff like figure eight racing, or you can do normal like circuit racing. They also have like a weekly term tournament that you can join in for bonus experience points and, and, and cash. And then they have demo derbies if you want to just do a head to head, you know, crash until you die kind of thing. Nice. Um, there is a kind of realistic damage model that makes it harder to drive your car the more damage you take. Like damage to your wheels, your brakes, or your engine, or whatever. Um, but it's it's one of those if you really just want to play a racing sim, but you want to be rude. It's a great game. Yeah. Speaking of crashing and simulation, and uh, well, you mentioned Kerbal Space Program, which I'd like to touch on now. So you said it was you know easy to uh, fly the rockets or the ships because they essentially fly themselves. So would if I be you right in assuming them correctly? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so would I be correct in assuming that the uh, main difficulty of the game uh, is in designing the spacecraft? Yes and no. There are certainly some areas where you're going to need some good piloting skills no matter how well your rocket is designed, particularly when you start looking at doing things like, you know, docking two vessels together in orbit. That's a, a very fiddly process that it takes a lot of learning to get used to. Anytime you're doing like landing or uh, leaving an atmospheric body with not a just pre-constructed rocket, like getting to orbit from Kerbin is fairly easy. But if you landed on something else with an atmosphere and need to get back up, the the difficulty starts to spike rather dramatically if you're not sure what you're doing. But good planning overcomes most of those challenges. A lot of the learning curve is not necessarily how to design a good rocket, but like figuring out what a good design is for the mission that you're trying to fly. And every, all your hard work can be unraveled by one incorrect press of the time acceleration. <laughs> that is very Everything true. will explode. <laughs> that is very true. Alrighty, well, I say we kind of covered a good amount of strategy and simulation games. Do you guys have any other things to add or any more to add? No, I think that... I think actually leaving there gives us a great segue into our content showcase because the first thing that I want to show off is actually from Kerbal Space Program. So this one is our first screenshot and this is from uh, Cosmo. And this was like the first Kerbal Space Program 2 screenshot that we had in the squad from a squad mate. And just like... Oh wow. my goodness, it's beautiful. <laughs> I really like, I don't know, this sense of, I don't know if liminality is the word for it, but it's just sense of, you know, it's, it's all empty. It's just mm -hmm. a ship and then the big expanse out there. And I believe this is on um, the Mun, so, you know, mm. definitely a, a very alone feeling. But I, I think one of the other interesting things to point out here is like this exceptionally weird uh, rocket design, uh, which... Yeah. Cosmo has described as uh, his rubber chicken rocket. Yeah, I was going to ask why there was a, a chicken or a rubber chicken or a goose in the middle of the picture. <laughs> yeah, so so that's the rocket. 
And like the thing that tripped me out about it at first was like I couldn't quite tell from this angle, but I thought like the big wing things were he was using to double but as wings and landing gear. But when I started looking at some of the videos from this, no, he's landing on the engine bells. Those wings are just like there. Yeah, you can actually see. You can <laughs> see in the uh, picture as well that the uh, wingtips just barely hover off the top of the surface. And uh, so in addition to the the big ones that you can see really clearly in this picture, um, between those, there's also like much smaller wings. I have no idea what they're for because you, you wouldn't need them for atmospheric flight control because you've got the huge ones that are going to give you all the all the drag and control authority you need. They're just kind of there. Uh, maybe um, flare. Maybe there's a weird physics bug that he was encountering because I know KSP has some weird kind of mm -hmm. glitches and bugs with that. That's why the physics doesn't quite make sense and it, by just popping on a wig in a random spot fixes it. And it might have been that he was encountering some kind of bug. <laughs> I think I remember him saying it was primarily for aesthetics because he just wanted them there. He thought they looked cool. <laughs> Which, like, okay. <laughs> just like... It's such a weird design, and, and and I love it because, like, okay, this is extremely Kerbal, yeah. but also, like, you get this shot, and it's like, there's this sense of aloneness. So, like, this texture for the Mooner surface is not as good right now as, like, highly modded KSP-1, but at the same time, like, the light engine and stuff is so much better that, like, I can tell that within a few months, Kerbal Space Program 2 is going to make KSP-1 look like a mid-90s game. Like, the the foundation yeah. is there for this game to just get so much prettier. Yep. And KSP-1 was kind of like, it was, it had that realism, but it had kind of almost cartoony kind of graphics for your planetary surfaces. Yeah, it was realistic, but it wasn't photorealistic. And this is... I would say that's pretty close to photorealistic right there. <laughs> yeah, it's getting close. And, like, uh, if you see some of the screenshots and footage from around the Kerbal Space Center, like, you'll start to see more of that realism come through. Like, footage I've seen around the KSC is just gorgeous. So let's move on. And next, we're going to look at a shot from our fearless leader, Useless Fodder. And uh, this is from Operation Harsh Doorstop. And the Starship Troopers mod. I uh, I saw this one earlier when you when you sent me the the slideshow, and I I was like, goodness gracious, that's a big bug. <laughs> yeah, would not want to be around those, uh, especially not with. I feel like the gun that he's holding right now is a bit underpowered, to be honest. Yeah, I don't I don't know that I'd want to be shooting any kind of like insectoid because they're gonna have more of an exoskeleton and so like i feel like you definitely want 762 for that armor piercing most likely too and yeah. uh those hesco barriers are not helping with keeping them back at bay no yeah definitely not the first thing i because i i remember the original starship troopers movie and how, how kind of goofy it was and i saw this quote in my mind and i was like but i kept thinking i was like it's not from Starship Troopers, it's from Star Wars. And I don't know why I thought of it when I saw the bug and I thought uh, of the quote of, good thing those bugs can't aim, but, I mean, they're, <laughs> it's just, they're, they don't have guns, they have melee weapons. But. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm um, doing my the, part. The other one that popped was, I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part! <laughs> Which, fodder's about to die, I have a feeling, that in that screenshot. <laughs> I... I would certainly imagine so. Yeah, speaking of Fado, we uh, can also segue into the next one, which is uh, this beautiful composition screenshot made by Scarecrow in Armor 3 uh, on the occasion of Jesus Fado's birthday. I mean, this guy is just so skilled uh, with all his uh, screenshots. He really captures the scene really well, especially in Armor, which is pretty... Uh, lackluster in terms of posability and uh, models but with the right mods and all that he's able to create these beautiful sceneries and uh, you know really tell a story through the facial expressions and the uh, body language and the setting and it's just really well done yeah i'm always impressed by scarecrow like we could have an entire podcast just of showing all of the cool scarecrow screenshots from the month because like 
He's so active, and like everything he does is this level of quality. But I knew, I knew as soon as this one came up that I'm like, oh, we're talking about this one during the squad cast because we'll be talking about the birthday event. So I love it. It's so good. A uh, great part about this screenshot is uh, the fact that uh, as an armor player who's played with these assets that he's using, he used a combination of modded and vanilla assets, but also he managed to capture pretty much what the useless fodder looks like in a a default, you know, uh, facial, the default facial features of a ped. Now, what we really need is a photorealistic useless fodder mod. That's what we need. <laughs> so, so what we're gonna need then is somebody's gonna somebody's gonna have to go visit fodder and get us a good three D scan of his head. And well, then we can, here's the and funny we thing: get to work on it. Oh, I live about come... forty minutes from fodder. Okay. Yeah, we should compile so, all the mods. So maybe we maybe we get a three D scan of his face at some point. Okay. <laughs> I was uh, I was actually following kind of the chat when this when this was going on. Um, it's, I think Scarecrow brought it up that he wanted to make a, a fodder birthday party screenshot. And there was actually a couple other submissions, but Scarecrow definitely takes the cake. I think there was a Vietnam one, wasn't there? Yeah, too? the cake. Takes uh, the cake. <laughs> takes that the was, cake. That was Boom! unintentional. I know. Get him out of here. Um, <laughs> it's great. Yeah. This, this screenshot is definitely, and the fact that he has Mr. Miller on the right there from the original story of Arma 3 attending fodder's birthday party is... It's great. It's very cool. Milo has become an armor meme at this point. He's just great. Yeah, there were there were a couple other really great ones, but like I I just loved the energy of this one so much that I'm like, this is the one. But definitely recommend that anybody who's in the Discord like head over to the gaming photography channel and like scroll back up to like the beginning of February because there's there's some great ones in there. Yeah, that's just. It's a great channel. Uh, Saul is also very active in there, and he makes some nice, you know, beautiful scenic screenshots with the lighting and all that. Oh, yeah. His OHD uh, screenshots have been bonkers. Speaking of lighting, uh, this one's from you, Gus. Uh, you've been <sighs> playing this game called Atomic Heart. Uh, yeah, what can you tell us about it? I mean, this is a beautiful, gorgeous game set in the, uh, I guess... USSR? Yeah, so this is a alternate history game where the USSR uh, won World War II. And I think probably the easiest way to describe this is that my opening experience in this game harkens back to my opening experience in the original Bioshock. It, like, this is the first time since the original Bioshock that I've loaded into a game and just been floored by how good the graphics are. And, like, not to say that I haven't played any great-looking games, but, like, this one feels like a step up in ways that we haven't had in a generation. And, like, yeah, the, the reflections off the water and everything moving around, the particles and rays, like, it's just mind-blowing. But the graphics jump being... Uh, on that same caliber as the original Bioshock. Like, the similarities don't end there. It's very much an uh, alternate history, and you've got uh, sort of elemental-based combat powers and kind of that weird, like, mix of steampunk and mid-century gothic architecture style. Like, it's really really interesting uh, a lot of bioshock vibes strong strong recommend it to anyone that loved bioshock you know it it reminds me of uh wolfenstein which is another good kind of mm -hmm. post world war ii game but on the flip side where the axis where germany won and uh i played it a long time ago on console i think on ps3 and i know they've got a new game out i forget what it's called wolfenstein something um, new colossus maybe New Colossus, maybe? I, I forget. Um, anyways, that game is pretty, I guess, in its own right. In the more kind of brutalistic, um, Nazi-ish mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. architecture and stuff like that. But when you said that it's a post-World War II where the Soviets won the war, I thought, oh, that sounds a lot like Wolfenstein. But yeah, it does... Just, just looking at the screenshot does give me Bioshock vibes as well. And it, it just keeps going further and further as you get into it. I, uh, I'm i definitely excited to get back to uh, finishing up this game. Yeah, I really do like the um, atomic era sort of aesthetic with the uh, robots and the curves. And, you know, it's that new wave of technological advancing 
which evolved to change into what we know now today. But imagine if it had kept going in that same style. And I just love these alternate history uh, settings where you can see that style just get expanded rather than suppressed. Right. And I think uh, we move into our last game screenshot. Uh, this one is from leo and is frostpunk i played a little bit of frostpunk like a week ago it's you know kind of simmy slash strategy uh kind of in the the city builder vein but it's set in like a post-apocalypse uh where you're in a state of horrific winter and so you've got to manage like heat levels is your sort of primary thing so your people don't freeze to death i don't know how he got the camera this close to the ground uh and that's kind of why this picture's here because i'm like i don't know how we did this i like how there's a distinct uh frost border around the uh, picture which really helps sell the uh, entire like cold freezing harsh environment Mm -hmm. When even the camera itself is starting to get frostbite. That's a great pickup. I hadn't actually noticed that until you mentioned it. But yeah, that's a, a, little that's bit a of blur, great touch. Kind of the blur around the edges and the kind of encroaching tendrils of, of ice or, or frost. Yeah, yeah, it's really good. Have uh, either of you two played Frostpunk? I have not. It's in my library, I think. But it is definitely one of these games I want to try at some point. It might be on Epic Games. Yeah, okay. I haven't played it either. It's another one of those. I think it's on my wish list. I always seem to miss it when it's on sale. Yeah. With my computer issues recently, I haven't really considered buying any new games. It is on Game Pass. So, if, you know, if anybody's got Game Pass and they want to try it out, like it's free over there. So worth mentioning that. Mm. Okay. Oh, and so is Atomic Heart, actually. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. I, I forgot the Game Pass is, is what it is and that... There's so many, <laughs> so many guns, or so many guns, so many games available on that platform. It's incredible. I think speaking inc of incredible, uh, our last piece for the showcase uh, is not from a video game at all. This is a resource that uh, squad mate Call for Fire is helping put together, and it is a guide for military toxic exposure. Uh, that he's doing in collaboration with Burn Pits 360. And I am just like, it's a cool design, but I mean, the part that's really like important and incredible about this is like what they're going to achieve with it, which is helping support veterans. And there are a lot of veterans in the FOD squad. And so this is something that's uh, a really important issue to a lot of us. Yeah. Um, I'm actually in Call for Fire's Discord as well. He posted it over there before he posted it in um, FOD Squad. And it's a pretty cool thing. He's actually been working on it for a couple months now, on and off. He's posted updates every now and then about pages that he struggled with or, or pictures that he found or people that he talked with about it. it. I don't have any... I'm not a veteran. I don't have any experience with that kind of stuff. But I don't remember if he's... If it's something you can print out yourself, it's a PDF, or you have to pay for it. I can't remember... But I know that you can either message him or go to his Discord to find more information about it. Yeah, yeah. So it's not finalized yet. And like Bacon said, um, we'll put some links into the description about resources for this. Um, what what he told me so far was that like the best place to point people would be the Burn Pits 360 Facebook and Instagram. So I'll have links to that down there because I know once he gets this done, things will be different. But for now, like those are the the best two resources yeah it's just great being able to share information uh you know with people and help them this is a great thing overall yep. now shall we move on uh we have upcoming events for the months of march and april starting with march 18th with Skylion or Skillion, Skylion Blitz, which is an infantry only art being put together by Ray and set in the Mass Effect universe. Now, I've never played Mass Effect, but <gasps> it is. What? Um, yeah, I have not, but I really do look forward to it because I know it's this, it's one of these beautiful, well uh, developed uh, sci fi settings and. Uh, you know, there's lots of lore around it. Also, a lot of seduction, apparently. So <laughs> I hope. Well, I don't know if I hope so, but maybe there will be a feature of that in the uh, operation. Probably not, but Mass Effect, one of those games I intend to play at some point. Mass Effect 3 was a great game. <laughs> you should definitely play it. I'm in love with the Mass Effect franchise. And so, like, normally 
uh, an infantry only op is something that I would be skipping because I am a terrible combat liability in Arma. Um, <laughs> but because of the setting, I'm going to give this one a go. And so I'm I'm definitely looking forward to it. And yeah, I, I stray away from not coming to infantry only ops. I'm a I'm an aircraft or an armor guy. And so I like my heavily armed armored skin around me when I'm fighting but sometime i might i might check this out especially if provided i'm not having computer troubles and can attend and also hopefully that i don't know if the mass effect if there's a mass effect mod for arma 3 i guess there probably there is. is obviously i haven't seen yeah. it so i don't know what the the assets are like and the resources and stuff like that but i can imagine that it if it's made by the same kind of people that care so much about starship troopers and star wars that I can imagine it'll be a good mod, and Ray makes great ops, so, I mean, that's a guarantee right there. Yeah, absolutely. And then uh, coming up in April, we talked about the potential for this during uh, last month's Squadcast, but we have the official announcement now. Uh, Operation Kajari Stabilization 3 is going to be happening on April 25th, so that's the, the third installment of Hoodle's series, and he's going to be planning it for Anzac Day, which I believe was actually when we did the first mission in the series. Yeah, I believe so. Yep. Uh, we don't have a lot of details, but I mean, anybody who's taken part in this Kujari series, like we're all stoked for a part three. And I, I can't imagine it's going to be anything less than stellar. Hoodle has been just absolutely crushing it. Yeah, he's really dedicated to uh, the Kujari stabilization series, put in a lot of work with uh, making this world you know very unique uh even created this fictional nation called kujari uh, which is really nice i like the uh implementation of australian defense force which is you know you don't often see them in uh, media because they're kind of you know the underdog i guess you could say but who knows doing them justice by you know making us all experience what it's like you know just the sign up sheets and the uh op ord that he makes at the beginning of the mission uh you know when people sign up is just Stellar. There's so much detail. It really makes it feel like an official classified document. And uh, yeah, I really look forward to this one. He, uh, and that map, Kujari is a great map, by the way, to play on. Um, I put a lot of Liberation and even Antistasi on that map. And it is by far one of my favorite kind of uh, African open maps. There's not a lot of height. There's not a lot of height in the terrain. It's fairly flat. So you, you and the AI are on f fairly... Uh, even playing grounds. The airports are great. I think there's three or four airports on it, which is awesome for anyone that's doing a cast based or or helicopter based operation. The roads are great. The rocks are very brutal. There's lots of rocks everywhere, so cutting off road means goodbye tires and and lots of bleeding from Ace Ace Medical. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, great map and and his Kajari stabilization ops are just top notch. All right, well. I think that is going to do it for us today, gentlemen. I want to thank Badger so much for coming out to join us. It's been a real pleasure having you here, man. You want to remind people where they can find you and any closing remarks you have? I did do some Twitch streaming. I haven't recently. I will be... I'm I'm always up for games for the most part in FOD Squad. I've been doing a lot of 5M recently, um, which is the roleplay uh mod for gta 5 you're welcome to ping me if you want to play any of the games i listed in the strategy simulation category i'm kind of down and out for arma right now with computer troubles but i can still play squad i still can play snow runner ats i'm always willing to drive with you if you need if you, if you want somebody to drive with you in either convoys or truckers mp my most common form of contact is just Discord. My Twitch isn't very active anymore. Or you can hit me up on Steam. I'm usually just Badger, and I have an Arma 3 profile picture on Steam. All right. And Bacon, any closing remarks and, and info on where people can find you? Oh, yeah. It was a great episode of the podcast. You know, it's just great the uh, being able to sh talk about what's going on in the Fart Squad. And, uh, yeah, it was a pleasure being there. You know, my name is Bacon. You'll find me in the Fart Squad, as always. Uh, mostly in the Armor channel. Uh, I do have a YouTube channel every now and uh, I post every now and then, mostly just clips or VODs from what I'm recording the entire session of a um, Fart Squad op. But generally, you'll find me in the Discord just chilling. 
Uh, so feel free to stop by, say hi, and uh, probably see you in the uh, next operation whenever that happens. Sounds good. And I have been Gus. Um, primarily uh, consider myself a YouTuber, so you can find me uh, at Gus Schultz on YouTube. And uh, in the Discord, I'm one of the welcoming committee on the integration team, so I might be the first person that you talk to once you get there. Um, other than that, uh, you'll find me simulation and strategy are sort of my main homes there, but also uh, gaming photography and, and some of the other stuff as well. And so, again, I want to thank everybody for coming out and we hope to see you next time.